Uh, we're going to be we're going to be sensitive to the time because we want to make sure that we have time for questions and answers at the back end. Uh, Eric and I were uh, discussing we discussed these topics at length over dinner and you know those types of things when we were together out in the field. So we thought it might be interesting to bring that conversation forward. Uh, it's not going to be quite Joe Rogan. We're not going to be quite as meandering as all that, but this is going to be more of like an interview kind of discussion back and forth on a subject that's really interesting to both of us and hopefully to the audience as well. Um, uh, both of us have quite a bit of experience and maybe Eric, you can start by introducing yourself and giving, you know, why this topic, what, what has taken you through your career to lead you to be interested in discussing platform teams today with us. Yeah, absolutely, Michael. Thank you. Um, so yeah, Eric Reeves. I'm a I'm solutions engineer here at HashiCorp. Uh, in my former life, I was a hands-on practitioner for for 17 years at a at a SaaS shop here in Houston. Right. So we started with a you know, a small rack of servers, made it all the way through the you know introduction of automation, sort of the discovery of this DevOps stuff, and ultimately landed at a multi-region uh, you know data center exit cloud deployment. So I've sort of been through a lot of this pain and involved in this you know DevOps. Uh, uh, cultural shift that's been going on. Um, and I'm really, really interested to see how it has evolved kind of from, you know, DevOps to things like SRE getting introduced. And now, you know, the big talking track is this, this platform team thing, right? So um, very interested in just sort of what, you know, what challenges it's trying to address, um, why, why it's even a thing, right? And how organizations are, are responding to, you know, infrastructure getting more and more complicated without yeah, necessarily having to have all of their employees, you know, increase their cognitive load to an unmanageable level, right? So it's an interesting space. I love discussing with you. Yeah, and and I'm coming from uh, a little bit of a similar space. I, you know, I started with very large on-prem data center, you know, companies that I worked for uh, as a practitioner, and then moved into leadership and eventually senior leadership. Um, holding holding a little bit of an executive role, running multi, you know multi regional uh, engineering groups, uh, and part of what brought me over to HashiCorp, in fact, was that I built out a couple of best practice innovation labs, uh, fully automated, so that we could deliver rapid execution, iterative deployment to uh, to customers at at rapid speed, using a lot of user centric uh, practices, test driven design, extreme programming, all of these types of things. Uh, made a lot of mistakes along the way and learned, you know, kind of skinned my knees and burned my fingers, but also had some wild successes, uh, which really made me fascinated with the organizational change that's required to make this happen. And I think, Eric, you and I would agree that as we talk about this shift into multi-cloud and platform team orchestration and these types of things, uh, a lot of this is really not a tools problem. It's a, it's a people problem. We've got more tools than we know how to even begin to deal with. The question is, is how do we make all these tools work for us in a good, clean way? How do we even understand what tools are being used when, where, and how? And, and really, the only way to do that is to think somewhat centralized, I guess, is the way that I would put it. Uh, but how did you see in your journey this, this shift that is leading us towards, well, first off, let's just try to define this. What is this mythical beast that we're referring to as the platform team? There's so many monikers out there, CCOE. Uh, the DevOps group, we'll hear tooling teams, we'll hear, we'll hear all of these various monikers, but, but how would you define like a platform team? Sure, no, that, that's a great question to sort of frame this up because um, all, all of these terms get a little bit washed out in, in you know, the blogosphere. So I, I think ultimately, right, all of this started with this, this notion of DevOps, which was a, you know, a cultural shift that focused on more collaboration between at least at, at the core development operations, right? Um, because those things seem to be, they tend to be uh, seen as at odds initially, right? Um, change is the enemy of stability. Operators are protecting stability and developers want to introduce change. So uh, at, at the very core of all this is an understanding that these these teams, are, all these people are trying to get the same thing done, right? It's having some empathy for you know, what, what another team's area of responsibility is, what their area of expertise is, and what they're trying to get accomplished. Pardon me. So... You know, ultimately, when, when we take this to the platform team level, um, th there's a lot of technology involved in, in doing this stuff right. Um, and, you know, what we have are, are not generalists, right? The initial sort of DevOps mantra was everybody should know more about everything. Well, that, that really doesn't scale. You can't expect everybody to be, 
uh, a specialist in every area. We, we should understand and appreciate that folks have areas of expertise. Um, they, they have areas of skill and things that they know a lot about. So what we want to do with the platform team is sort of encapsulate that expertise into something we might vaguely term a module, right? Um, not necessarily a Terraform module, but just in a more abstract sense, right? A module being a, a, a small process, or a small bit of reusable code. Maybe it's a, a bit of infrastructure policy, or it, maybe it is a bit of Terraform code, et cetera. But when you are able to bake that into something that can be reused, um, then everybody can get the benefit of the expertise without necessarily having to know, you know, quote unquote, how the sausage is made, right? So it's, I think, I think to sum it up, it's kind of abstracting away complexity in a manner that allows everybody to take advantage of all of this awesome stuff without having to be experts in, in every piece of it, right? Yeah, it, certainly the driving force for why it needs to exist is the cognitive load concern. You know, I think when we look at it, like there's 500 services that I need to understand intimately in AWS to be highly successful in AWS. And I, I use this example a lot where I say, you know, there's something like 200 um, security services uh, that are AWS native. And then, of course, you've got the marketplace services. And if you were to say, as a dev team, be responsible for leveraging the ones that best fit your application, that assumes you know all 200, even if you're only going to use 16. Well, if you're picking 16, it means you understand all 200 and you're picking the best 16. I, I don't think that that's reasonable. Like we, we can't walk down that path and really feel like that's, that's going to be best practices. That's one of the areas that I got burned as we built out these labs is we tried to do generalists and we ended up with some horrible architectural decisions because we didn't understand some nuance about Cisco and we needed a CCIE, somebody to like look at it and see what we were doing that was wrong there simply because we were trying to be generalists and some of these things are just highly, highly technical. We need to understand those deep dive uh, pieces to make sure that we're not introducing frailties that otherwise, you know, an expert would have seen like that and a generalist would just miss it. So the more that we think about this, yes, we need these highly technical experts, but we, we don't need everyone to be a highly technical expert. And we used to solve this with like ITIL, ITSM. You file a ticket, you know, the CCIE folks on Cisco would, would do the, th the job that they need to do. And then we would pass the ticket on down downstream to the next person who needs to answer to DNS assignment, you know, what DNS assignment, then, then your firewall rule, then your load balancer, whatever, whatever the order of operations was. And some of these you could do in parallel. But the point is, is I have these different networking teams that I'm passing this, this ticket along and it's just slow. And so the more we start looking at that is, okay, well, how do I automate that? How do I take the, get the value of a really strong expert in that particular skill set and automate that, as you said, via some form of module or code asset, which represents that distilled knowledge. And we started with this idea of, uh, I think we had things like cloud acceleration teams or CCOEs, which is where we would establish best practices. We'd say, what, what is the best approach to landing zone in AWS? What's the best approach to subnetting in AWS? Or you know what, whatever that cloud is, we'd build out a center of excellence, which established those core best practices. But then a platform team takes that and augments it by saying, not only are we going to establish the best practice, we're gonna automate the delivery of the best practice so that as a developer, you can just deploy your applications and feel safe because the way that things are going to be automated on your behalf are gonna be proper and guarded and so on. So like the best practices is the most natural way to consume this. So think of like a CCOE as a function related very tightly to a platform team. In some platform teams, it's going to be part of the overall, uh, overall uh, team structure, which is going to be informing the automation that I'm building as a platform team. So the, the automation needs to constantly be reinforcing those best practices, the things that developers are cognitively overloaded on. Wait, so I need to understand FISMA compliance too. I need to understand resiliency, everything about Kubernetes, how the serverless function is going to come into it, how I'm accessing data, how that data is being protected. And I need to understand all the regulations to be FISMA compliant in this environment is too much. I can't, you know what I mean? I can't wrap my mind around all of it. So how does the organization rally to make this something that allows the developer to operate with, with trust that, that they can be FISMA compliant without having to understand everything about FedRAMP and FIPS 140-2 and all that kind of stuff. Just, just give it to me in a compliant sort of delivered fashion. So Eric, I see you brought up your, uh, your, your 
uh, kind of picture of operations via uh, and the concept of platform and, and producers and consumers. Maybe you can walk this down for us very quickly and then we'll move on to, um, to the next topic. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, we can get down in the weeds on this for quite a while, but I think just at, at a high level, it helps to, to, to visualize what, what form these teams can make, can take, um, and what, what some of the roles are, right? So as mentioned, like generally there's, you know, some notion of a cloud center of excellence where you're going to have your tenured architects that understand best practices that have done the things that we've done very badly and made mistakes and know, you know, many ways not to do things and maybe a few ways to do things right and can, can be the ones who maybe understand those 200 cloud services, right? And can make the, the appropriate recommendations for the ones that are going to be best practice to implement across the organization. Um, and then within that platform team also, then you're going to need some folks doing tactical execution, right? Your actual hands-on building these pipelines, et cetera, kind of being mentored by the CCOE. Now, maybe when you're starting, those are those are the same folks, right? You don't need to start with an org chart of 20 people to get this going, right? But as you scale out, these are sort of the, the different roles that you can identify and, and scale out to ultimately. Um, you know, off to the side, we see the, the community of practice where we're kind of referring to a lot of the consumers, right? If this is a producer consumer model, you can think of the platform team as the producers and a lot of this community of practice as, as the consumers, right? So um, automation, this platform team is going to sort of uh, engage with various teams in the community of practice to understand what their requirements are, try to deliver shared services that will accomplish those goals. And hopefully, you know, if we go by 80, 20, you know, be able to find some patterns where they can get some quick, you know, automate one or two patterns and get a lot of get got a lot of wins across the organization with that. Um, and that's also where folks like infra network security are going to be able to have input into this. Um, and as we mentioned, right, we have this concept of sort of these abstract modules. Well, whatever code form those modules take, what we can see what that what's important here is that these teams are collaborating by expressing intent into an infrastructure or policy code base that is then deployed and applied using some tools of some sort, right? Um, but just at, from a high level, hopefully this kind of helps folks to you know, visualize what form this is and, and you know, a few of the high level roles that exist within, you know, within this notion of a platform team. Yeah, and if I were to do a quick example using this, uh, imagine, and I'm just gonna use something fairly simple. I, I don't know if everybody here knows Kubernetes, but I'll just use it as an example. We all know that as an example, if, if you're into Kubernetes, you know that the service API needs to be locked down, ETCD needs to it, it can't be visible by anybody who hits that cluster. So I'm just using these as a couple of core best practices. And we would determine that in the Cloud Center of Excellence would be very well aware that in order to run Kubernetes in a secure manner, these two things need to be in place every time. Uh, it used to be, and I think things have changed a little bit, but there was a cloud vendor who by default, some of these things were open. And so we needed to manually close these, close these doors down when I provisioned a new Kubernetes cluster using their managed service. So knowing that the, the Cloud Center of Excellence identifies these are best practices. This is how we need to run Kubernetes in the cloud. The automation team would then provide provisioning code that says when you consume uh, AKS, GKE, you know, whatever version that I'm talking about, uh, these policies need to be in place. And this is exactly how we're going to create the Kubernetes cluster so that it's properly secure, properly auditable. We're going to plug in our observability tooling. And so as a consumer, the developers are going to say, I'm going to consume this, this uh, Kubernetes service. Those best practices are instilled from the get-go. So I don't have to think about it. I just inherit the best practices. And as a development team, I'm not consumed with trying to understand how to properly lock down a Kubernetes service because that's a lot of cognitive load on top of what I'm doing from a development standpoint. And Kubernetes is very, very close to developers. So that I'm, I'm starting with something that's actually very, very close with the developer. Just imagine now I go out to network topology policy, WAF configurations. You know, the, the further I get from the developer, the more opaque that is and the harder it is for me to understand. So the more of this I can deliver cleanly, easily, and make it very, very consumable, those best practices just become the way that I execute. There's not, there's not a clean way for me to avoid it. And why would I want to avoid it? I'm not trying to expose the company to litigation. I'm trying to do the right thing. So the more that we can sell that as what the platform team does, that gives you a little bit of a sense of, uh, hopefully this is helpful as a little bit of a visualization of like the, the kind of tooling that we're owning. The automation chain is owned by the platform team, the core module sets, the core security policies, policy enforcement, 
we're enforcing things from GRC and security and so on. And then we're trying to instill all of the best practices that, as an example, a CCOE would derive from years and years of experience of working with whatever that infrastructure is. Awesome. So from that, hopefully that gives you a little bit of a sense of how we're thinking in terms of what a platform team is. If you've seen presentations from HashiCorp before, and, and uh, this really isn't a commercial, it is a little bit of a commercial for HashiCorp, I guess, because we we do we do this for a living. But this is where all of our our all of our products align to the core services that a platform team would would uh, would present. So Terraform and Packer are about how we deliver infrastructure with policy and control and gates and access controls and so on and so forth. Uh, Vault and Boundary are going to deal with human gated access, uh, identity brokerage, all of the things that are associated with security in the cloud. Console is focused on networking, Nomad and Waypoint are around runtime and how applications get provisioned. So you can see as a company, this is really what we're looking to attack, is how do we enable these platform teams to deliver these services at scale with all of these compliance concerns that we're talking about here today. So at a high level, this is why we spend, Eric and I spend so much of our day uh, noodling on these types of uh, concerns. So with that, let's get let's go back a little bit and say, uh, Eric, you know, maybe you can launch into this. But how have we evolved to, to get here? Like where we've talked a little bit about, you know, we generally started with ITIL, ITSM. You know, we moved into you know more DevOpsy world where the cloud let me self service a lot more. So I gave a lot of operational control to developers. Uh, eventually, we found out that I can't really audit that very well when every DevOps team does all of their operations completely uniquely. How am I supposed to audit that? How do I know who's doing things right and wrong? Uh, am I just going in cloud account after cloud account and auditing everything they do manually? That's That seems daunting. So then we start moving a little bit more into cloud centers of excellence to establish standards. You know, this is more of a volunteer army, right? So, so we're going to give you the best practices and we're going to ask you, please, as an enterprise architecture team, follow these core practices. Or maybe you submit your work to an enterprise architecture team. Uh, maybe you submit it to be vetted by security or you know whatever. Uh, but now I have these kind of manual gates. And I suppose then we move into more of platform automation. CICD comes in. We start to add a whole bunch of other constructs to help uh, the governance there. Uh, but is there anything that you want to comment on? Like, In fact, maybe you've got examples from your journey as you moved from that on-prem cloud to you know, multi-cloud, you can give me a sense of how did you mature into more of that kind of platform orientation? Yeah, absolutely. So, right, we initially, you know, we were, we were all in the data center and realized that, you know, the automation is, is going to be key to making any of this work going forward, right? I mean, we literally started with the, the you know, the way the DevOps story all starts, right? There were developers writing code. I received a wiki page that gave me a list of commands to install packages. And then I'd have to ask questions like, um, how do I tell if this thing is working or not? Um, Cause I was on call as well. So it was, it was the classic story of, I don't know what I just installed, but now I'm on the pager for it, right? So, um, you know, initially it was focusing around just core automation, right? Um, uh, getting some configuration management in place, starting to build out some rudimentary pipelines. Um, and a lot of this was still done when we were, you know, operating in VMware, may have even been Zen at the time. Um, and then we started to make this shift toward AWS, right? So we started to dip our toes in, started to take some of that, uh, you know, what we might call legacy automation, right? Chef, like sort of on box configuration management and figure out how to uh, get all of that working in AWS, right? But AWS, there's this whole other layer of stuff that you need, right? Um, you know, we were automating systems, but we were not automating VMware infrastructure. And now all of those things are need to be defined as an infrastructure code. So sort of the dip our toes more into, um, we were a cloud formation shop, unfortunately, um, but still it, the patterns are all the same, right? So building out some, uh, building out pipelines, um, describing how we are going to promote artifacts from development to staging to production, where we in this process, we're gonna do things like vulnerability assessment. Um, and then, you know, started to get closer to what today we might call a platform team, right? Where you know, ultimately, we we are a bit more rigid about here. Here is the here is the path to production, right? Yeah. There is no there is no more logging into a console and deploying things. You're going to build an AMI. You're going to deploy that AMI using infrastructure code, and somewhere along that pipeline, vulnerability assessments will be done. Um, the pipeline will do things like check our change management system to see if this is even approved to go out right now, right? So, getting all of that. Um, what what we might call you know the business logic as it relates to delivery of software mm -hmm. encapsulated in these pipelines 
right? Yep. So that it's, you know, everybody follows the same process. You drop bits in here, some stuff happens and it comes out the other end, right? Um, some developers literally just want to write code. Um, others want to be a little bit more hands-on with the infrastructure code. But, you know, when you get to this platform team model, you, you can support both use cases in, in a way that is still logical and makes sense and still allows everybody to take advantage of this, this sort of automated policy code base that you, you start to build and evolve over time, right? Um, because when you once you get that policy code base to a place where it, it's covering all of your use cases, you can give developers a lot more freedom, right? You can say, I have enough guardrails in place within this automated pipeline that you can do whatever you want. And if you do something you're not supposed to, the system's going to stop you and let you know, right? Yep. So it's, um, I think one thing you said once that I really liked was um, sort of freedom through governance, which feels a little counterintuitive, but it's really not. It makes a lot of sense, right? When you have those, those guardrails in place, you can you can set them free. Let them go do whatever they want if they want to operate that way. Or you can just say, um, you know, if you're .NET, just drop your code here. Some stuff will happen, and then it'll be live, right? Yeah. So you can kind of cater to you know, the level at which uh, various app dev teams want to get involved in, you know, the the making of the sausage, so to speak. Yeah, and and uh, quite honestly, that that quote I stole from uh, some folks that Tim Ray is working with. Uh, at a at a at a at a bank here in the in the U.S. that was focused on uh, enabling developers to move very very quickly, uh, and they actually made the statement that we wish we had built our governance and policy sets first uh, in into code, uh, so that we could extend more freedom earlier as we matured into a platform team than we actually did. You know, we built a bunch of modules, required them to use those modules as is, because we know the modules themselves are compliant. But I didn't have compliancy code to vet that the module is still what I expect it to be. And so once they built all those governance gates and got those in place, then they could tell the developers, if you don't like our module, fine, build your own. But it still has to pass through this gauntlet. And if it can't make it through the gauntlet, it doesn't go live. And we'll provide you with that feedback. And I think you mentioned this earlier as we were talking about DevOps. That's one of those core principles of DevOps, right? Fast feedback. If I'm going to fail, fail fast. Let me fail before I even get to development, right? Don't let me even deploy this development if it's going to fail test and staging. Now, I may have a way in development as an example to bypass that failure. Yes, I know this is not going to make, you know, like I may open it up from a development standpoint that innovate, break policy. If you need to, you're in a sandbox environment, you're protected, right? So I may allow a violation to a policy there, but as a developer, you need to be aware this would never see production the way that you've structured it. And then that gives you the ability to get ahead of a policy violation. You know, let's say for some reason you're running a, a Monte Carlo simulation for risk analysis. You're asking for 10,000 nodes, but policy is going to prevent you from deploying that expensive of an infrastructure. I've got a cost policy which says, you know, no more than 100 nodes for an application, an analytics application or whatever. And you're going to ask for 10,000. Well, let me get ahead of the exception. Let me go ahead and file a ticket or send a PR and say, hey, look, this is a Monte Carlo. We're going to run it for two hours. It's assessing three different markets. It's a massive data set. If we don't run 10,000 nodes, it's going to take us 24 hours to run it. We can run eight hours if we run 10,000 nodes. You know, what, whatever that justification is, you can get ahead of that exception process and go ahead and get it put out live. But having that immediate feedback, just like you were saying, having those guardrails and those governance pieces in place allows the development team to understand what am I doing now that violates policy so that I'm ready by the time I get to production and everything's smooth sailing as I go into production. So I love I love that model. Uh, yeah, so a little bit about how it's evolved. A, a couple of things that I've seen that I'll just add on to this is a lot of platform teams begin, uh, as, as Eric talked about, very, very small. Uh, we're talking like a three-person team. And generally, what, it, what I'll often recommend is two of your internal resources. And then you're probably going to bring in a partner, uh, somebody who lives in the culture that you're trying to achieve. So if I can get somebody who has done, and I'll, I'll use our products because that's obviously what I know. But if I'm, if I'm going to do my module building in Terraform because I want my policy to sit outside of the clouds, and I want my policy to be transferable between multi-cloud. And I have all these reasons for having my orchestration sit above the cloud rather than baking it natively into the cloud. It's just more portable, affords me more protections and a couple of other things that I'll go into if we ever decide to sell uh, sell, sell this idea to you. Uh, but the idea is if I'm gonna move towards Terraform, I'm gonna want somebody who's run Terraform at scale and understands how to build reusable infrastructure modules 
assuming I'm starting from scratch, I'm using this as an example, like we're starting from scratch. We've never done this before. So my two native architects or, or, uh, or, or operations platform team members, plus a third party who knows how to run Terraform at scale. They know how to manage a code base. They know how to structure changes. They understand how to build reusable modules, how to compose those into more aggregated sets, that type of thing. Policy, all that. And then I want these folks working together to establish my core base operating environment. Now, as I go to, uh, I'm establishing a new culture here. This is not how the large of, of being in the industry, that I, I'm very sensitive to restricting or improving. Uh, it, yeah, I keep getting a note saying my my internet connection is fragile. Am I breaking up? Uh, you did you did for just a second, but you're you're good. Okay. You're good now. So as I look at it, it's it's like. Um, uh, I need to protect the new culture that I'm building. And so I need some real tight boundaries, which keeps those three people independent of this other organization. Every time we start something new, and let's say it's a thousand person IT group, and we've got three people doing something new, it's very, very easy for the other 900. because we're getting from our legacy toolkit, we're doing something completely new. We have a chance to do something completely new. Uh, okay, let me see. Yeah, I'm on a I'm on a Marriott network, so I'm not sure why it's being all fragile. No, we, we did lose you for just a few seconds there, but we're good again, so. Well, as you're protecting that culture, think about how you expand. We're gonna use these three people to get up and running. We're gonna onboard our first couple of customers, but then as we go to expand, I don't wanna expand with five people because I'm introducing a new culture which has more people on the new on the on the new culture that I'm trying to maintain. So sometimes when I think about preserving culture and, and growing culture, I, I may start by adding a single resource because I want them to be fully enculturated in the new approaches that I'm building. And then maybe I add two and then I'll add three more. Right. So I but I always want the good, the the future looking culture to overwhelm the people who are coming out of the old culture into the new. If that hopefully that's helpful as you think about like your cultural outcomes. So as you begin to scale this team and you add resources to the team and grow it out, think in terms of protecting the culture and, and protecting the method that you're that you're going after, because these are the ways that I'm going to measure and, and attack. Uh, any thoughts there, Eric? On uh, I've been talking for a while now, but as, as you as you think through culture and the approaches. What have you seen? Like, how, what kind of advice would you give to this organization on the culture around uh, platform teams? No, I, I I love that model of sort of um, you know pr protect, protecting that culture, right? Because I think it, it can be a mistake to sort of too quickly try to just fold them back into the greater org where you know you necessarily have you haven't necessarily changed these hearts and minds yet, and folks are still thinking the old way, and you know maybe a little grumpy about this this you know changing the way that they're doing things, right? Um, uh, one quote that I heard a long time ago, we used to say a lot, right, is, is that people don't like having change done to them, right? They, they want to be a part of this. So using that model you described, right, if you sort of, you know, bring, bring folks under the fold of this new way of doing things, you're, you're bringing them into in as part of the team. You're not coming in with some iron fist and saying that, that thou shalt now change the way you're doing things and use this stuff we're building, right? Um, you're bringing them into the fold. You're collaborating with them, making sure that they understand you know, what we're trying to accomplish here, making sure that you understand what they're trying to accomplish, right? This, there needs to be empathy here. Um, and look, folks, these folks have spent a lot of time building these things over the years, right? Um, there, 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 there is some, some pride and ego involved when you're asking somebody to change the way they've done things for a long time. But if, you know, everybody goes into it with open minds and kind of, you know, open hearts, which sounds a little altruistic, right? But, you know, the, the spirit of this effort is that we're trying to make things better across the board for everybody, right? And a lot of the benefits that, you know, uh, an app dev team is going to get by engaging with a platform team, as you mentioned, right? No matter how software is getting delivered, there's compliance that has to be dealt with. There's audit that needs to be dealt with. Like those are necessary evils, no matter how you're getting it done. So mm -hmm. if you can make a value proposition that, hey, look, we can take care of all of that, right? We'll have pipelines that ultimately are just going to tell you if you conformed or not. And that is off your list. There's a lot of benefit there, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and now, you know, the other little side comment I think is kind of important with a lot of this is 
when it, when it comes to audits, right? If you have a lot of this, this automation in place and you've got a large enough policy set that's being applied at every pipeline run, you know, you can sort of shift your audits to not necessarily an auditor having to go touch 500 systems and ask for samples from all these live systems, right? You can, you can make a general statement that we don't, you know, we, we only have a, a limited set of operators that can even touch production. And that's only for break glass production emergencies. Here are the documented times we did that. Otherwise, every change has one path to production. And yeah. that is through this pipeline that is applying these policy sets. So you can audit these policy sets. You can look at the logs of the pipeline runs and know yeah. that every release has gone through that. And now audits can, you know, you can literally shave days off of an audit, right? They may, just, they may need to spot check a few systems, but you can check policy and just show you're enforcing policy. And that's, that's huge because nobody likes dealing with extensively long audits, right? Yeah, and that really goes to what a lot of platform teams uh, sometimes neglect, which is what I would call sales and marketing. You know, I I know that sounds like a rough term when you're an engineer. You're not typically thinking sales marketing. It's not what I got into this job for. Uh, but as you really go out with a platform team approach, it really is about driving success for others. And uh, it, when I talk, uh, I worked with a large insurance provider that moved as an example, risk and pricing analytics was one of the first things that they moved into the cloud with this new operating model. And it took uh, audit from four to six months internal and four to six months external audit down to two or three days. Uh, Cause there were only three hands on keyboard instead of 150, you know, like there, there was a huge shift in how we operated the workload before into how we were operating it now that it was fully automated top to bottom with policy. So audit all of a sudden was just days, a few days internal, a few days external, I don't need year round audit to make sure we're staying compliant because we restricted the vectors of change, just like just like Eric was talking about. But once once they went live, it was not about, yes, the platform team received some glory about it, but who do we put on stage? We put on stage the risk and pricing team. They took the risk. Their budget was on the line. Their jobs were on the line. If this doesn't work out, this is how we're making decisions on how we sell policy, right? Like this is this is. So honor that, honor that and turn it into more of a hero. The hero cultures are the people who, you know, adopted the new way of operating. If they see that's a way for me to attain a claim and you'll recognize me for making this move, then that begins to sell the program and you start to see a lot more momentum because people want to come in and say, oh, I want to have that type of an, uh, of an engagement as well. It's very easy for DevOps engineers, and I'm sure you've heard this before, but uh, resume building jobs. Like we, we're in it from, I'm in it for myself. I want to prove that I can do chef and Ansible and, and, you know, like I, I'm, I'm going to prove all these skills and I'm going to hold myself up as the champion that made this thing happen because I'm looking at the next job. You want to be a little bit careful early on that that's not a lot of the mentality you want in the platform team, especially in the early days. Uh, excellent technical resources can make a, an incredible change in how fast you build out your automation. So I'm not saying that there's not a place for that personality type I'm just saying the early on build out need to need to be people that that hold others up as like, man, you did you did it the right way. Thank you so much for working with it. You influenced our backlog in this way. So I, I know recognition seems like sometimes we overlook some of these soft skills, but that recognition is really what's made the open source community so powerful. It's what it's driven a lot of our innovation in, the, in this space. So use it to your advantage in the platform team. Hold up people that do things the right way and consume this automation in a unique, a unique pattern. Uh, one thing that I will mention is uh, this is some advice that I've been giving recently on platform team adoption. Don't come right out of the gate disrupting developers. Um, you're likely not ready to go right out of the gate and disrupt developers. If they're using a, and I'll, I'll just use an example, if they're using a service now ticket to request this service today, leave it alone. Automate behind the service now ticket. You know, we we were talking a little bit earlier, Eric and I were on on. Uh, and, and I'm not picking on a vendor, but let's just say you've got a Palo Alto team that's managing firewall rules and you're submitting a ticket to Palo Alto, Net the Palo Alto network team, and it's taking six to eight weeks to get done. Okay, just leave the ticket there. They're used to requesting that network service in that way. Now let's just automate that with Terraform or whatever you're going to do on the back end. Let's just automate the delivery of those changes and take that ticket from six to eight weeks down to a half hour once once we've approved once the human actor is approved and hits plan a reply leave the human to respond there like I, I haven't completely removed fte from this equation but the time that the fte has to spend is is negligible and because i'm consuming a pre-built artifact that is well known by that ccie group 
I can I, I have a level of trust out of the gate that that doesn't require me to go into all these UIs and make changes and and double check my changes and have somebody audit me and blah blah blah. I, I have a pre-built artifact that I can consume. And then once I've matured my automation to the point that I'm ready to disrupt the developers, then I say, hey, how about instead of a ticket, you just do a git commit and we'll pick it up there or we'll pick it up from that trigger or that this git action is going to call me, whatever it is that you that you feel the more optimal pattern is besides the ticket. But don't, don't go right at them and say, throw out all the tools you've ever used and, and start over. No, you're not, you're not ready for that. They're not ready for that, and you're going to lead to some early heartbreak with them that that could potentially lead to a failed program. So let's start automating behind those facades they're used to, and build from there. Any thoughts on that, uh, Eric? I know I'm, I've been talking a while here. No, no, that, that, that's all fantastic, and I, I, I like that idea of making sure you kind of consider what is you know that we deal with APIs all the time. Well, these teams kind of have APIs as well. You're not programming interfaces, right? But the, wh how, are, how are these other teams going to interface and engage with the platform team is an important thing to consider. Um, and and I, I like that that idea of not disrupting things up front, right? Just make the work faster. Um, yep. Now, eventually, I guess, I think you sort of get to what you might call maybe a phase two of this, right? Which I think I've heard you refer, refer to as like the community model. Um, yep. You want to sort of talk through what, what, what that sort of next stage looks like? Yeah, uh, so I did some research with our largest, most successful customers and uh, was identifying three core models for driving self-service out of a platform team. One I called the inner sourcing model, which is more or less what I just described. That we leave them committing a ticket. I have a slightly larger platform team because I'm, I'm manually taking tickets and implementing automation on the user's behalf and then providing an environment on the back end, granting them access to what they need to do. On the, this pr protects the platform team because I can be making all kinds of changes in my automation chain, but I'm not disrupting developers because they're abstracted via this ticket. They don't they don't even know I'm I changed secrets engines or the way that I'm provisioning network. None of none of that affects them. Just their time is the only thing that they're really paying attention to. Uh, so I'm somewhat abstracted, but this is what I would call inner sourcing. The second thing that I would talk about uh, is the what we call the community model. So once I have a baseline set of automation that at least provides things like guardrails, if I have the ambition of changing the overall organization, then I start to focus on things like onboarding, knowledge base, uh, tutorial Tuesdays, um, you know, demo Wednesdays, or you know, whatever I'm doing, it becomes community outreach. And every time somebody comes into the community, I'm showing them how to DevOps their own environments. If, if I'm talking Terraform as an example, I'm teaching them how to work with Terraform to create their own infrastructure environments to request self-service infrastructure uh, within the guardrails that I've presented for them. So they're not going to be able to touch WAF and all this kind of stuff. Uh, as we as we kind of go along this path of maturation, I'm going to keep learning what people need to have. I'm still doing some white glove. Uh, you know, they're having questions. Maybe they first come into Terraform, they run into a problem, they can't get this thing to deploy, and the operation team is answering. But in the community model, eventually what we have is we have a, several teams of highly successful developers who have come in. They begin to become the community support for the other development teams. And that's when that flywheel really begins to turn. It's the community is supporting the community on the automation. And so now I don't need maybe 50 platform members to serve thousands of developers. I only need like 20, you know, a smaller, a smaller team for this core orchestration because develop, the community is helping the community, not just the core platform team. And then the third model that I would talk to is uh, is sort of back towards ticket, but in a self-service, no human in between. And that is what I would call a full auto organization where I have kind of an abstracted UI or something like that, where they can sort of pick their way to an environment. And then behind the scenes, that's triggering my downstream automation, my secrets management, my you know wiring into the NOC, my observability tooling. All that stuff is happening behind the scenes. They have no idea where it came from. All they know is they went to a UI and they pieced together an environment that they wanted to hit go. Um, so, and then that's more like seven platform engineers for you know a little more than a thousand in this particular users in this particular customer's use case. So, think about like where the investment lies in the first in the first example. The investment's really in the platform team and the tooling. <clears throat> the second, the investment is in the com community and a smaller investment in the platform team because I'm doing more protections and gates and, and walls uh, We uh, in CIO, uh, the CIO dilemma or 
at one of those books, it talks about play with fences. I want to enable innovation by allowing people to play within fences. So if that's my goal culturally to play within fences, then, then more of the community model is the right way to go. Uh, more than likely, you're going to have a mixture of these, right? Some teams are going to come on and they're going to need, they're going to come through a ticket because that's just how they operate. That's one of my user constituencies that I'm trying to support. So I'll, I'll keep that ticket alive as long as I've got consumers who are consuming the ticket. Then I'm going to have some community members that need to do something unique, bespoke, like we, we haven't done this before. Then I'm going to have others that are coming in. And, you know, you may say like 95% of web applications have exactly the same architectural demands. Why do they need to be modifying anything with HCL? They, they don't need to be an HCL. Why? That doesn't make any sense. Just provision your web app and go. Don't, don't worry about anything downstream. Um, so I'll, eventually, if I'm highly mature, I may have different uh, APIs for each of these different groups. Anyway, long-winded, right. but hopefully that helps. No, that's that's fantastic, right? And I think you know, if folks ask, well, is this are you know are, are these steps or you know are these like multiple phases that'll exist at the same time? And I, I think the the answer is kind of yes, right? Um, clearly, you're you're pretty much everyone's going to start with one, right? You've got to have one that implies that you know you've got a team working on some automation, but you're you're retaining that user interface, right? The ticket, keep that where it is. Um, Community models that will just sort of naturally occur as folks, you know, app dev teams start to get their hands dirty with using some of this tooling, like the teams that want to control their own destiny a little bit more, then you get that mutual support starting to happen. And then, you know, I think everybody also, a lot of organizations want to get to self-service, right? The sort of vending machine model. Um, yeah. But I think, I think all three are, are going to, you know, potentially permanently exist. It, it might just be appropriate for some teams to stay on that ticket interface for a long time. And that's, a, that's fine. Right. Um, some teams might be more hands-on and want to get to that community model. So, right. Is it, is it a process or is it, you know, are all three existing coexisting? And I think the answer is like, yes to both. Right. Yeah. I, I would say, I would say the answer is yes. Uh, some, so you, I guess part of what I'm asking leaders to do in this space, especially like the platform team lead, or maybe this is the CC, the CCOE lead, uh, as you think about what you want to take place, let that be your guide for like the first interface that you implement. If your goal is like, let's not disrupt anybody right now, just start at the ticket, right? Just don't, don't worry about, you know, because uh, you do want to be deliberate in building out the community, right? Uh, how do I have people collaborate? What are the approaches for poll requests? You know, I'm going to think of, I'm going to think through how I want to function function as a community practice. But if but if the goals early are not that, then here's here's how I would think about where I would start. Which interface is correct for me to start with? Uh, when I was working with an insurance provider, they wanted to change the culture top to bottom. So let's just go right out the community model. Don't bother with the ticketing piece. If you're going to the cloud, you're going to do business different. Here's how it looks. You know, and that was that was just a that was a cognitive decision that they made. It didn't happen by accident. Sometimes I think what we do in a lot of platform teams is it's just kind of by accident. We're, we're implementing tools and by accident, we implement you know this practice or that practice. Uh, with the last, I know we're, I want to be sensitive to time and make sure we've got a good 10 minutes or so for a question and answer. Last topic I want to hit are just like metrics. Uh, and I'll just toss this over to you. How would you think through measuring the efficacy of these teams? No, that, that, that's an excellent question because you know, it, clearly, the, you know, the, the the establishment of a platform team requires an investment from the business, right? And this is this is resources, the people that are going to be doing this work specifically. So, clearly, you need to be able to to show that value to the to the business, right? Um, and the way you show that value is not, hey, we we built some Jenkins pipelines, right? I mean, that we we need to communicate this value up to C level execs, and ultimately, what we're really trying to do here, right, is to streamline delivery of of value into end users' hands, right? Yep. Truly. So we say things like pipe CI CD, that means nothing, right? So how do we how do we define some some KPIs that will ultimately show, you know, number one, that we are we are able to deliver value faster. Um, velocity is important, but then number two, that we're not increasing our, our failure rate as we're increasing velocity, right? So a few metrics I think that are you know distill that down and reflect it pretty accurately are number one, your deployment frequency, right? Out of the gates, just how how often are you are you running deploys? Um mm -hmm. The more frequently you're running deploys, that means you're sort of adopting one of those DevOps tenets, which is small, small batch sizes, right? Um, a lot of folks will think, well, if I'm releasing more frequently, it, it seems a little counterintuitive that changing more faster is actually going to make me safer. But when you have smaller batches, you know exactly what's in those batches. Um, 
it, 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 you're not actually mitigating risk by releasing less often, because then all you're doing is queuing releases up, right? You're still having work done by developers. It's just getting log jammed between behind these releases that all come out uh, once the floodgates open. So now instead of releasing one thing at a time and having it easy to triage what's what's broken or what's changed performance characteristics, you've got 10 changes all bundled together to just make it more difficult on everybody, right? The, the, the bigger a release is, the more risky it is, the scarier it is, the longer you wait, you might wait too long. And that's just, that's a place you don't want to be either from an application owner perspective or an operations perspective, right? So yeah, deployment frequency will tell you that velocity. Um, lead time for changes. So how quickly can you get from business idea to actual running service in production, right? Um, if you have a lot of reusable patterns, that time can be shortened significantly. Uh, mean time to recovery. So this is, this is more on the SRE side, like putting on my SRE hat for a minute. If, um, if you're getting to a place where all of your deployments are flowing out to production via baked images, right? You've got Packer, that is maybe you have a base image and you have an application image layered on top of that, deploy with Terraform. Anytime you change anything, you flow it through that pipeline. Um, then one of the neat things you get uh, along with that is a roll forward is the same thing as a, as a rollback, right? Because yeah. all, all the pipeline is doing is changing the artifact version. It doesn't know that the number is greater or less, right? Um, so that that is hugely beneficial because lots of teams will write down upgrade procedures. A lot of them will, you know, and they probably practice those, right? They might write down a rollback procedure, but they actually test it. And even if they did, does it work? <laughs> um, right. So when you have rollbacks being as easy as roll forwards, there's a lot of power in that. And then all of those are ultimately trying to, to show that we are increasing velocity. Well, the most, you know, the important one at the end we're going to track is our change failure rate, right? Yeah. We want to make sure that as we're increasing velocity, we, we, in theory, should be decreasing our change failure rate because they're smaller, safer changes. Um, if something does go wrong, since now our mean time to recovery is shorter, we can just quickly roll back and get to where we were. So, you know, we just want to make sure that as velocity is increasing, that change failure rate is not tracking or trending in the wrong direction as well. Yeah, I, I love the 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 door metrics are, are great for that to show me sort of efficacy of what it is I'm delivering. It kind of gives me some hard numbers of how 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 am I enabling the company to move faster and leaner and, and with less risk as we move forward. Um, a couple of other things that I would use to measure the team maybe uh, is net promoter score. I'm very careful with net promoter score because I want to understand how happy I'm making developers, but understand, and, and for those of you who've been around NPS for a while, you you recognize this, net promoter score never goes like this and like shatters 100% satisfaction and keeps going. Generally speaking, what you see is you see kind of a dip in net promoter score when you introduce something new because they're a little frustrated that they're having to take on this new practice. And then you see this bump where they go, oh, wow, this really did make a difference. And then you'll see it level back off at steady state. And steady state means it is a good sign because I, I got acceptance. This is the new norm. So that means whatever I instilled is now the new norm, which is great. But I'm not expecting, like, if I look at today's net promoter score and five years ago, they're probably going to be fairly close, even though today we're five times more efficient than we were then. It's just the net, they, my expectations have moved. I, I expect an iPhone-like experience. I don't expect a green screen on a mainframe like I did 20 years ago. Like th those types of things have moved, but my net promoter scores remained relatively sa stable. But as I, as I think about that, I do want to see if that, if I see that little identifiable pattern. Okay, yes, they are changing because I see this, I see this dissatis a little bit of dissatisfaction. And then, oh, okay, yeah, they saw the value, you know, of the of the accepted new thing. And now I'm back into steady state, which equals kind of exception, uh, uh, acceptance of the new practice. The second thing that I would look at is, okay, in addition to that, sort of to balance that off, um, uh, let's look at the cost of the delivery of a particular service. So if I start to, uh, if I start to look at as, an, and I'll go back to Palo Alto, if Palo Alto is that six week thing, that's too expensive. That's too, that's too, it's too onerous. It's too uh, error prone. Uh, I need to bring that way, way down and make it easier to consume. Otherwise people may circumvent, you know, we may end it with shadow networking connections because uh, it's too painful for me to get through there and I'm on a deadline. So, it, you know, I don't want to cast dispersions on anybody, but that, that this is how we end up with, with uh, shadow IT and, and odd networking routes and all that kind of stuff. So can I make this a joyous experience to consume? And Palo Alto has tools for this. You can look at Terraform for this. There's a number of ways to solve this. I'm not prescribing today anyway, like one particular route to solve, but I want to see that go down to 15 minutes and a self-serve interface on the front end. That is a reduction in cost 
which allows me to move much, much faster. So if I look at it, so it, let's say I'm the leader of the platform team. Some of the things that I'm going to measure are those Dora metrics. I'm going to measure my user acceptance and satisfaction. And then I'm also going to be looking at each one of the services that I'm responsible to drive out in terms of cost. And that cost is going to include risk, FTE. Like there's going to be a number of factors that go into cost. I'm not saying purely tool time. I'm looking at toil. I'm wrapping a bunch of things into that cost metric. And I want to see that bubble get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. The lower cost it is, the more joyous an interaction I'll have as developers go to consume. Now, we've gone about three minutes over because we, we wanted 10 minutes for question and answer. Uh, at a high level, to summarize the conversation, uh, the way that we're talking about this is platform teams are real and kind of mythical. Like we, we are seeing these platform teams come out, but it's an evolute, it's an evolving space. What is a what is a platform team? What's in? What's out? Those things are still being worked out by the industry. We hope to share with you a little bit of a pattern for what we're seeing and how we're kind of bracketing what we see in that platform bucket. Uh, we're, we're looking to reduce cognitive load. One of the key drivers for something like platform teams is it's just too complex out there. I can't understand everything. I need to find a way to narrow. Uh, there's a couple of competing uh, adages out there. One is, um, you know, who owns security? Everyone owns security. You know, you'll hear those types of platitudes out there, but then you'll hear another platitude which says, if everybody owns it, no one owns it, which is a fact, right? Like, because well, I'll I'll take these two pieces of security and you'll take these two and then these three, nobody thought to take ownership of. So we need to snap these lines of ownership of who is responsible for the delivery of that of that security service at scale and take that off the developer's need because not everybody can own that core service. It just, it, it becomes chaos. So as we think about cognitive load, that's a driver for things like platform teams. And we are going to grow into this, lean into the journey. It is a journey. Uh, Google didn't show up with their operating model just out of the blue. It was a bunch of PhDs from Stanford and 20 years of investment. Relax, you're not trying to be Google. You're just going to grow iteratively towards these, towards these cultural outcomes. Take small chunks, prove success, crow about the winners, Right, like really talk about people who up to these new practices, sell them, uh, make them heroes and rock stars, and grow that culture uh, carefully and gently so that you maintain the culture that you want. And then pay attention to your measures, determine what it is that you want, and hold tightly to those measures. Those measures are going to be what helps you sell up to the executive team that this is a this is a uh, investment worth making. Here's what we're getting you with every iteration that we deliver. And and don't you know don't neglect things like sales and marketing. So I'll stop there at a high level. That's just kind of a quick summation of the discussion. Uh, we really hope that you got something out of this today, and we're open for questions. Feel free to come off mute and just uh, ask. Looks like we have one in the chat here. Eric Michael. Sure. So, uh, th so these metrics should be seen on the platform UI. That that's a great point, right? Uh, if you're you know, collecting metrics at a number of levels, right? Both at the kind of system performance level, but then also right, or organizationally, how, how is my organization performing? Talking about those door metrics, like your, your deployment frequency, lead time to changes. Um, you know, those are a little a little bit tougher to, uh, to, to track, but it is possible, right? There, there are tooling solutions out there for, um, you know, sort of tracking JIRA issues, throwing it on a dashboard. There's, there's a number of ways just from a, a tactical perspective, you can collect those metrics from, you know, the systems in which you're documenting issues and documenting developer work. But uh, I absolutely agree that, you know, there should be some kind of a dashboarding tool at the end of the day that's able to aggregate those things because having a, a haystack pile of metrics doesn't do you a whole lot of good unless you're able to distill them into some dashboards that can tell a story which is really what you're trying to do with these metrics, right? You're, you're trying to, to show progress um, against a plan, right? To folks who may not understand what's going on in, inside the black box, right? I mean, they know that ultimately you've got folks that are delivering value using software. They wanna see that they're delivering that value more quickly. Um, so at the high level, you definitely want to try to distill those metrics out in, into some dashboards that you can share at appropriate levels um, that are hopefully automatically updated. There might be some manual work, but you know, that that is worth considering also is, you know, maybe pick and you don't have to have metrics for everything out of the gates, but pick what you think is your KPI, right? If you want to focus on minimizing risk or mitigating risk first, um, you know, maybe then it's the number of number of vulnerabilities, how long vulnerability remediations are taking, like, think about the first problem you want to solve, how you're going to measure it, um, get a baseline, and don't forget to do the baseline, because you need to show that you're actually progressing against that goal. 
um, and try to have a way to visualize it. And if you can have all that done automated, even better, right? Yeah, and, and I'll stress one of the things Eric said is at the appropriate level. So some of the metrics that we were talking about may be at that exec level, so at the platform team level. But then for like, as we were talking about, like the Palo group that's automating the delivery of Palo Alto networks, uh, I want to see a lower level dash that's looking specifically at my service, how my service is being consumed, what's the satisfaction of the consumption of my service. So I'm going to have different levels of that general you know, frame. I think the frame holds true whether I'm talking about a micro function with, you know, let's say networking within the platform team uh, versus the entire platform team itself. Um, so different levels of abstraction, but generally speaking, I think the frame holds true. Excellent, awesome. Thank you for the question. That was, that was a good one. And uh, thank you. Thank you for the kind comments, Nicholas, David, Rick, Joe. Definitely, definitely appreciate it. And, and do hope that this has been, you know, been able to grok a little bit of value out of uh, us rambling to each other back and forth here for a while. So appreciate it. Yeah, and, and I've got a couple of minutes if we wanted to go over, but uh, thank you very much. You all uh, really appreciate the time. Uh, we're, we're at time, so feel free to, uh, uh, well, obviously feel free to drop whenever you need to drop. We, you all have day jobs. Uh, but uh, if anybody does have a question, we're here for another couple of minutes and then we'll we'll call it. Yeah, I can I can go over as well if anybody else has anything else they'd like to to chat about for sure. All right, Felipe. Um, so question is, what could be a form of getting a platform culture on a small company uh, if you only have ten to twenty developers? So I I, I think, and you know, I'll kind of comment a little bit and pass it to you, Michael, but I. I want to say it's it's not too different from doing it at a, at a very large organization, right? In, in both cases, I think it's it's important to start small, right? Um, it maybe only need one in a small organization like that. One really skilled person could probably move the needle in in a pretty significant way. But even at a larger organization, um, you don't necessarily just because the organization is larger doesn't mean you want to start with fifteen or twenty people, right? You don't don't think you're going to boil the ocean or eat the whole elephant at the, at, all at once coming out of the gates, right? Um, you want to start. In either case, I think you want to start small and you want to pick a use case, right? You want to sort of identify some low hanging fruit where you're going to bring some benefit to that application developer. You're going to be able to have a measurable KPI that you can show, you can show an improvement, right? You can show this win, show that this, this, this team is now able to deliver features more quickly. We're having fewer failures, right? Whatever you choose that KPI to be, you can show that it has made a significant improvement, right? Um, so kind of strangely, I, I do think in both cases, it's it's kind of the same story. It's 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 start small, pick a use case or two where you can quickly iterate and show a win and then allow it to naturally evolve uh, past that using some of those patterns that, that Michael talked about earlier and, you know, with growing it small and protecting that culture, right? So, and, and Michael, I, go yeah, ahead. and I, I would definitely go with SaaS services. Uh, so don't go self-hosted, and I'll pick on us. Don't don't use our enterprise product where you're going to manage your own vault cluster and Terraform cluster. That's going to be heavy overhead for a team of ten. Like that's you know, so. So think in terms of what can I consume from a SaaS consumption model, so I don't need the additional operational heads to manage this thing at scale. Let let HashiCorp. I, I'm using us, but you think of any service that you're going to consume. Use use that hosted service so you don't have the administrative overhead, because uh, you need to reduce that level of of, uh, uh, of consumption. You're just not going to have the heads to to work on a highly resilient vault multi cluster, you know, like all that type of stuff. Just go ahead and use the the SaaS provided service and the SLAs that are available there. Simplify what you do operationally. Like get as far out of that operational piece of managing the toolkits that you are managing, and focus on the practices and policy. So as you invest in uh, individuals. There's going to be, you're going to go straight, probably community model with 10 to 20. But so we're going to go straight community model. Everybody's going to have, be, it's all hands on deck making this thing move. But I'm going to use these SaaS provided services and I may have an admin or two maybe tops that are helping to manage, you know, kind of the cloud organization that I'm, that I'm playing in. And then 10, 20 people will be consumers. And they'll also be producers, producers and consumers. So I want to see those best practices. I want those best practices audited by the group. But we're all part of a community. Does that make sense? So I, I'd probably go community model, and then I'd build it out using SaaS native native products. So I'm not in the, um, you know, in the operations game. If I if I can't if I don't have to be in the operations game, I don't want to be in the operations game. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and with that, with that small community, right, it's, uh, you don't quite have enough folks to have, you know, dedicated PM over this necessarily, right? But you, you can ensure that the backlog is, is exposed, transparent, and, and collaborative, right? Um, you know, ha have meetings with team leads and identify, you know, he here's the work that we think needs to be done next. Yeah. And have conversations about, you know, well, I'm feeling more pain here and this is causing me problems because of this and sort of, you know, decide collectively where, where priorities are going to sit uh, in terms of where, where the biggest fires are that need to be put out, right? Yeah, and I'll be honest, as I think about it, it's, it really is a beautiful place to start. And, and the reason is, is everybody takes ownership. Like, this is our game. This is our company. This is our, we are setting the culture for the future of the company. Like, you can really build out a strong, because this is just barely over a two-pizza team. You know, if we're talking DevOps, it's barely over a two-pizza team. Uh, it's, it's a little bit big for a two-pizza, but it's, it's close. And so we can kind of include everybody in the journey. And if we're doing SaaS provided services, I'm not really training people on retrieval of logs and you know all these types of things. We'll 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 have a couple of people that focus on that, uh, but otherwise everybody else gets to contribute to what's the automation look like. If this is compliance that we all need to hit, we all need to be aware. Here's how the policy is going to look. We share everything. That's it's it's actually kind of a cool place to be, Felipe. Yeah, I know a lot of folks at large organizations are, are probably envious of working on a, a small and nimble team like that, right? So that is a that is a cool and fun place to be for sure. Yep. Awesome. Any last question? No, I think uh, that is everything from the side chat here. Unless anybody has has a last minute last minute one to toss in. Looks like that's it. Um, I'll be sure to share out the recording uh, with you all. I know there are a few questions regarding that. So you'll get the recording um, as well as some more resources as well. So. Awesome. Yeah, really appreciate the time, everybody. Uh, thanks for all those who hung out to the very end and really for everybody who, who was on. I know everybody's busy. So it, this is really valuable time that you spent with us. Uh, if you have any feedback or thoughts on platform team structure or things maybe you think we got wrong or could do better, feel free to share that uh, that information with us. We're in it to learn as, as hopefully we communicated that, but Eric and I are just constantly learning. And most of the time we're learning from you. It's not, I, I'm not trying to manufacture this from some ivory tower. I'm working with customers. So if you have experiences that you're willing to share and help us to understand more, we are certainly open to constantly taking in that feedback and learning and growing. That's that's what this thing is. So we really appreciate the time. Thank you for being part of the HashiCorp community and investing that time with us today. With that, cheers, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers.